Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word. Real serious stuff today. Uh, Ezekiel has been carried before the elders of Judah. That means those in charge, probably the ones that serve the courses of Baia and so forth. And he took him up above the sanctuary so he could see what was happening in God's house told him to look to the north, which is where God's throne would sit, as it, documentation, Isaiah chapter 14. <clears throat> and they had an image there they were worshiping instead of God, our Father. They let it slip in there. And, and the Father's jealous. He doesn't like that. He doesn't want you to put anything before him. Not your car, not your house, not your job, not a nothing. If God doesn't come first in your life, then you're in a heap of hurt as far as blessings are concerned. You want to remember that. So we would gotten down as he kept showing them the terrible things that were happening that go contrary to the Word of God, right in the very sanctuary, you might say right in the church itself. So we'll pick it up with verse 7 of chapter 8, the great book of Ezekiel, God strengthens you. That's what the word Ezekiel means. If you listen to his word, he will strengthen you. Verse 7, and it reads with that word of wisdom from our Father. And he brought me to the door of the court. This is where judgment takes place. And when I look, behold, a hole in the wall, something secret going on here. Verse 8, and then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, the door. And naturally, this means covered or hidden. They, they don't want you to know about this. Verse 9, And he said unto me, Go in, and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. You know, this is what happens when you don't pay attention to God's Word, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and you begin to listen to the traditions of men, that if you're not careful, they'll make void the Word of God. They'll take you down Primrose Lane and dump you. So always stay with your Father's Word. If you're not pleasing to Him, you're going nowhere. And next verse, please. Verse uh, 10. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel betrayed upon the wall round about. I mean, there were pigs and creeping, unclean things on the wall in the house of God. And, and certainly, um, you know, you might, well, we don't have anything like that in our church. Oh, if you don't happen to in your school rooms have Eve eating an apple, maybe, or something like that, which is not biblical. Oh, well, I should say it is. She did eat it. No, she didn't. It's not in God's Word. But you see, men kind of add to, and men's traditions make void the Word of God. Verse 11, And there stood before them seventy men of the ancients of the house of Israel, and in the midst of them stood Jeazaniah, the son of, of Shaphan, with, with um, every man his censer in his hand. They were priests, okay? And a thick cloud of incense went up. Now, here's well, what, let's, let's zero in here. What has been said? Jezaniah means what? Heard of Yah. Heard this about God. Yes, I did. And what does Chopin mean? It's a coonie. It means a rabbit. Okay. Like an Easter bunny. Hippity hoppity. Well, is that biblical? Not in God's word it isn't. But it's a heathen practice. And they claim they heard it from God. 
They do many things with incense. It looks, but brother, don't you know with the incense and the incense going up, it looks so religious, so holy. It may look that way, but there's creeping, detestable, anti-godly things in the midst of it. Let's look deeper. Verse 12. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery, they're doing it secretly. For they say, the Lord seeth us not, and the Lord hath forsaken the earth. It's not going to happen. It's the same yesterday, and we wonder if we even believe in him. So we just kind of do whatever we want to and drift off. There goes God's blessings. Okay. God will never bless anyone with that frame of mind. Verse 13, and he said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. How can it get any worse? Well, stick around. Let's look at it. And let's compare it to today. 14, then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, right at the church, which was toward the north. That's right where God's altar is. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Well, now, now, who is this? Weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz and Ishtar. Tammuz means proud of life. Okay. She was the little goddess idol over animal and agricultural life and obscene riots, rites around her uh, little throne in the forest, rolling eggs of fertility. And, and the little Clooney from the rabbit from up above. You see, <clears throat> they would change Ishtar being right here in with this. And Ishtar is a pagan name that was translated one place in the King James to Easter instead of Paschal, which it was supposed to be Passover. And here you have all these heathenistic rites that were brought into the very temple, the very house of God. Well, I'm sure glad nothing like that goes on in our church, you might say. Oh, what are those little children carrying those baskets for? Now, uh, I, I know they mean nothing, and I know the little children are innocent. But I guarantee you one thing, I'd hate to have to stand in that pastor's shoes on Judgment Day. Because judgment begins at the pulpit. And if they're going along with Tammuz and Ishtar, you know, it's real easy to document what I'm saying. <clears throat> the word Easter, as it is listed in the book of Acts, check it out in your manuscripts if you understand the Greek. Or if you don't understand Greek, get simply a strong concordance. Check out the word Easter and see what it really is in the Greek uh, tongue. It's Paschal, which is Passover. And who became our Passover? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 and 7, Christ became our Passover. Not some quick like a bunny. And, and not some eggs of fertility from Ishtar early in the spring. But the blood on the cross that forgives our sins and brings blessings from Almighty God to defeat Satan and the very head of Tammuz, which would that um, those rites that turn away from God's word and make God's word void by these traditions of men. I, I know that may offend some, but it's better for you to be a little offended now than on judgment day. God is not happy with such carryings on. Verse 15, Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this? O son of man, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. Again, I would say, how can it get any worse? Verse 16, and he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. I mean, right down where it's supposed to be. And behold, the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar, right where poor old Zacharias' life was taken, where about five and twenty men with their backs, their what? Their backs toward the temple of the Lord. They got their backs turned on Lord. 
and their faces toward the east, and they worship the sun toward the east. Sun worshipers, instead of worshiping God, well, thank goodness we don't do that in our church. Oh, well, some people have these sunrise worship services. Where did it start? Oh, well, dear God, I don't know. Well, you'd better be finding out. You know what? Uh, you could you could really get a pretty good look at it if you went back to Second Kings chapter twenty-three, verse five. You're not going to have it, but make a note of it. I'll say it again: Second Kings chapter twenty-three, verse five. Listen to it. And he put down the idolatrous priest, whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places, in the cities of Judah and in the places round about Jerusalem. Them also they burned incense unto Baal, to the sun, and to the moon, and to the planets, and to all the host of heaven. So where's God? Not God, they didn't. And he brought out the grove from the house of the Lord. That's where the rituals took place, timber worship, without Jerusalem, unto the brook Kidron, and burned it in the brook Kidron, and stamped it small to powder, and cast the powder thereof upon the graves of the children of Israel. Kidron is the little valley that runs between the Mount of Olives and the East Gate, and there is a cemetery there. God's not happy with that. He won't accept it, and he break down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord, where the women wove hangings up for the grove, and I mean, and God won't, does not like sodomy. He will bless no city. He will bless no people. As a matter of fact, he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, and he has destroyed peoples, Benjamites, by the drove who practiced it. And he brought all the priests out of the cities of Judah and defiled that, and defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense unto Geber from Beersheba and break down the high places of the gates that were in the inner end of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were on a man's left hand at the gate of the city. So there you got it. Nothing new under the sun. And people continue making the same mistake over and over and over. Well, but brother, we don't want to offend anyone. Then do you know something? If you don't want to offend Satan, you're probably going to hell. If you don't want to offend anyone, you're probably not going to, you're going to lose the blessings of God. If, if you make a covenant with the devil himself, and that's what you're doing when you go along with a lot of the political correctness that you've got in the world today, with sodomy running a bliss, and, and oh, just let some Christian say something against sodomy. And, I mean, they would try to crucify you, but it won't do any good because God's on the throne. He's the one that ends out, hands out the blessings, and he blesses those who, who go against those things that offend our Heavenly Father. So we don't have to sweat it. Our Father's in charge. He's in control. But if you want to know where it started, that's where it started, and it continues even to this day. It kind of goes by different names, but you just look and you can see these same events Change the name, and oh, they're so happy with it. Um, and um, uh, the um, this sun worship toward the east, uh, Father calls it Shemesh. And you worship something beside God, and then you want Him to bless you? Oh, dear God, take care of my little children. Forget it. You either are with God or you're against Him. Verse 17, Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this? O son of man, is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Do you know what they do? They put the Asherah to their nose. They turn their nose up to God. And they make light of the branch that is coming from Virgo. 
the very virgin herself, the branch, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And they snuff and turn their nose up at truth. They'd rather go along with what is politically correct. Hey, if you don't want the blessings of God, bye-bye. That's your choice. God leaves it open for his children to love him, to receive him, and obey him. But you start making your own little religions and thumb your nose with arrogance at the living God and see what it gets you. It's a one-way ticket, and I think you know where to. It gets hot there. Tote that don't even, won't even hold it a light. Uh, that's the Valley of Hinnom. That's where Christ would describe hell in Gehenna. Verse 18, Therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. That, that is in the book of Hosea, Lord Not going to be any pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. If you want God, to, if you think God doesn't hear you, just practice some of those things. Just go ahead, make him jealous. He's a jealous father. Why? He loves you. He, he absolutely sent the Son in his name, Emmanuel, God with us, died on the cross, whereby you can be cleansed with that blood of the Lamb. Over you, whereby that that is evil must pass over your house. He is our Passover. And rather than that, you would participate in Tammuz and Ishtar and the ways of the world, sodomy and Gomorrah. That's your choice. You can either be blessed or cursed. Verse 9, chapter 9, rather, in this great book of Ezekiel. He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near. Even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And, and this destroying weapon is exactly that. Now, he's going to pick seven people. Many, many people think they were angels, but no. When, but, well, they have supernatural powers because God gives his elect strength. And it can be almost supernatural when we come to the point where he takes the inkhorn and marks the people, those that are against sodomy, those that are against the things that happen in this world. When he sets them aside, they have special powers. As an example, don't, don't make it complicated. When God's elect are delivered up before the Antichrist and the Holy Spirit speaks through them, nothing can pre pre detain them. Nothing can prevent them. The hand of God is upon them. And naturally, they have special powers. God gives it to them. So uh, these are seven which are symbolic of God's elect. Okay, But here, we've got a destroying weapon along with it. Verse 2, And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, that's where God's throne is, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, that's fine linen from righteous acts, okay, with a writer's inkhorn by his side, and they went in and stood before the brazen altar. Well, now, if you've got six and another shows up with an inkhorn, how many is that? Well, six and one, seven, okay. which always means spiritual completeness. And, and these seven have the seal of God. That's what that inkhorn is about. Verse 3, And the glory of the God of Israel, that's the Shekinah glory, was gone up from the cherub, the cherubs that covereth the mercy seat, whereupon he sat to the threshold of the house, and he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. In other words, he's giving a direct divine order. And, and it's given from the very mercy seat itself that appeared on those vehicles we heard read of in chapter 1 there by the river Kibar, which means uh, 
in the Hebrew tongue a length of time, not the length of a river. When the time is right, it happens. Verse 4, And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that are done in the midst thereof. <clears throat> this, this is real simple. You go in, and everybody that hates to see this sodomy, everybody that hates to see these things that go against the law of God, that see this worshiping of Ishtar and Chamus, that hate to see the people misled, you mark them. Why? Because of marking God's elect. In other words, putting the seal of God in their forehead. Because this destroying weapon that these carry, do you know what it is? It's the truth. It's the word of God, which is a sword. And that sword will either bring you into eternal life, or you'll be spiritually deader than a hammer. We're not talking about a physical death here. Now, I want to tell you something that is really fascinating in this verse. It's real easy for you to check it out. The word mark here is a little bit unusual because the word mark is tov, tov, which in the ancients, and that's what we're talking about is the ancients, is the letter T in the Hebrew alphabet. Not your modern square block Hebrew that came from Syria, but the ancient writings, well, what was the Tav, what did it look like? A cross. It was, it was a T, much like it is even to this day. You place the cross on the forehead of all those that know the truth, that hate to see this sodomy and stuff going on, that want to serve the living God, that want to do what's right, you place the seal of God in their forehead. Do you know what you know what God gave Satan orders when he came as the Antichrist in Revelation chapter nine, verse four? He said, Don't you dare touch those that have the seal of God in their forehead. That's why they have special power. Satan cannot bother them. And then God tells me, You can sting all those that are dumb and deceived, but don't you dare touch any one of these. Off limits for you. And God prohibits it. So this mark, this tov, is very important. But you know something? It isn't for the man with the ink horn to seek you out. It is for the Word of God to find you and impress itself in your mind, whereby that mark is automatically placed upon you. It means Christ man, a Christian, to do what is right in the bidding of Christ and not the traditions of men that make void the Word of God. So here you have the very act of sealing God's elect. You want to read about the sealing in a closer manner? Chapter 7, the great book of Revelations, where they wanted to bring, the four winds wanted to bring the end of this time. And, and God said, stop until we seal God's elect in their forehead. That's what's going on. And that's what we're doing right now. When you take that Word of God and teach it chapter by chapter and verse by verse and break it back to the original whereby those with ears to hear and eyes to see can see the truth and follow it. We're coming up on precious times. The wickedness that you have been showing in this chapter, you don't have to look very hard, far in this world today to witness every bit of that right in the house of God. Verse 4 to continue. Verse 5, rather, to continue. And to the others he said in mine hearing, I, I could hear him say it, Go ye after him through the city and smite, and let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. You either get that truth out there, and if they don't receive it, they're spiritually dead. They're going to whore after the Antichrist. Verse 6, slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, the tov, and begin at my sanctuary. 
you begin right in the church itself, right with the head preacher. Then they begin at the ancient men which sat before the house. A spiritual death comes to those that will not receive the truth. Well, brother, I just want to do what's politically correct, and I don't want to offend anyone. Well, how about Satan? Have you ever thought about offending him? What are you? Are you a, are you a wimp? Do you have no pride? Do you not care that God loves you? That he stood for you? He paid the price for you? He taught you the truth, or the truth is available? He wrote you this letter telling you these things would come to pass. Now, you either want God to love you and bless you, bless your family, or you want to go the way of the heathen. It's strictly your choice, 100%. You're not judged by what somebody else might say, but by what you say. Verse 7, And he said unto them, Defile the house and fill the courts with the slain, and go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. When, when they refuse that seal, when they refuse the real truth of God, they're spiritually dead. I mean, they miss the first resurrection. Okay. And, and who knows what will happen in the millennium. We're not going to judge them. God will. But they miss it. That's why they're spiritually dead. And a spiritual death, in this sense, is far more serious than a flesh death. A flesh death, you're already in paradise on one side or the other, waiting in the millennium. But a spiritual death here could go from one abomination to the other when the appearance of the Antichrist, if you're ignorant concerning God's Word and you don't even know who the Messiah is, and, and you end up worshiping and the false one, you're in worse shape yet. Verse 8, And it came to pass while they were slaying them, and I was left, and I fell upon my face, and I cried, and I said, O Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? All seven vials of God's wrath are going to be poured out. Okay. And J Jerusalem, Yaroshalem, is the city of peace. It's supposed to be. They cry peace, but there's not going to be any until the Prince of Peace returns. Second Advent. Verse 9, And then he said unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood. And the city full of perversiveness, sodomy, where they say, the Lord has forsaken the earth and the Lord seeth not. We can do whatever we want to. He doesn't care. What a, what a great error to make. And then all the same person would say, well, he never helps me, so I know he doesn't exist. I don't blame him. I wouldn't help you either. If you practice perversiveness and you are the very filth of the earth, get away from me. If you hear the truth and you want to rise above it, then we'll talk. But if you choose that style, hey, bye. It's your choice. You're happy doing it. You better have happiness quick because that's all you're ever going to have. Our Father... If you think that he ignores what goes on in this world, you are sadly mistaken. Do you know why? Well, my letter is in my church. Oh, no, it isn't. Your church cannot do a thing for you compared to what the book of life has in it. And guess who keeps that record in the book of life? God does. And do you understand that everything you do that is contrary to God's Word. It goes in the book. It's there waiting for you. Don't ever think God's ignoring you. It's there. It's written. It's in the book. Now, naturally, your good deeds are also in that book. And when you repent, if you mean it, if you truly want to love Him and serve Him and you repent, He erases it and gives you a clean start. Just like that. He paid the price to be able to do that. But that's where your record is. So don't ever do like these idiots that say God doesn't see us and God doesn't care and God doesn't know. 
He's keeping score every day, every hour. The score is kept. Why? You're his child. He made you different than anyone else. Your DNA is different. Your fingerprints are different. He wanted someone just like you. You're unique. So naturally, he pays attention to you. If you're no good, well, the book says it. It's written. Or if you repent, then you can change your colors right away and be blessed of the living God. Strictly up to you. You can't blame anyone else. I would say there is one person that will be blamed heavier than anyone else. I would sure hate to be in their shoes. And that's the head pastors that allow junk, that allow little children to be misled. Well, it just really, I don't want to offend them teaching the truth. Then you're sorry. You're no good. Because truth is real love. And sometimes tough love must be. But if you haven't warned them, you'll suffer their responsibility for their sin. So the head pastor gets to the closest judging. You want to pay attention to the letter. You want to pay attention to the book of life. Your name is there. What of what is written by your name, especially if you don't teach truth? Well, I just don't want to offend them. Then you offend God. That's serious stuff. Verse 10, and as for me also, mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense thy way upon their head, period. Verse 11, to complete the chapter, and behold, the, men clo the man clothed with linen, which had the ink horn by his side, reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. And that's what we're in the business of, is placing that truth in the foreheads of those that will listen, those that will hear. And that truth must continue to be brought forth. And truth is truth, and falseness is falseness. The choice is yours. Well, how, how could I tell? Well, by sticking to the Scripture, by doing your very best to learn those Scriptures, to have the ability to do a little translating on your own. It's quite simple with the tools we recommend, whereby you cannot be deceived. Most of all, if you have that mark, that tav, that's the cross, if you're marked with it, God's going to take care of you pretty basically anyway. You're blessed. What a wonderful thing it is to be blessed of the living God, especially in this generation, rather than being cursed. All right, don't miss the next lecture. Bless your heart, you listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast.